It's my very, very distinct honor to welcome back our speaker for this evening, uh, the Honorable Donald Chung, uh, who will speak on a tale of two systems. Welcome back in so many ways and in several different times because um, Donald Chung was a, a student uh, here some year or two ago, um, <laughs> sometime in the early 80s, um, and so we're especially proud to have him back especially now during our 75th anniversary, which is a time of, of celebration and where we are trying to bring back people uh, such as, uh, as uh, Donald Chung, who's done such remarkable things. First, let me start by thanking uh, faculty such as Tony Sage and the Institute of Politics, who've done so much work, and Melody Jackson, who's done a great deal on the HKS 75th team. Um, Mr. Chung is the chief executive and president of the Executive Council of the Government of Hong Kong. He's also a Mason Fellow, a graduate of the MPA program in the class of 1982. Um, many of you know that for many years, uh, Hong Kong was a British colony. It was handed over to China in 1997. The British and Chinese political, economic, and bureaucratic systems are obviously very, very different. But our guest tonight has accomplished the near impossible. He has managed to thrive and to make enormous uh, contributions and be widely recognized for those contributions under both systems. Uh, he joined the civil service in the British colony in January of 1967. Um, in 1977, he was attached to the Asian Development Bank in Manila and for a year worked on water supply and railway projects in the Philippines and Bangladesh. Then he, be, at, as Deputy Secretary of General Duties Branch from 85 to 89, he was responsible for the implementation of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Between 89 and 91, Mr. Chung was the director of administration and was responsible for overseeing the effective functioning of the government secretariat. He became director general of trade between 91 and 93 and was responsible for negotiating all facets of trade and was in administration involving Hong Kong in 93, he was promoted to Secretary of the Treasury, still under British rule, responsible for overall resource al allocation, taxation, and cost effectiveness. And then in 1995, he was appointed Financial Sir uh, Secretary, the first Chinese, uh, uh, ethnic Chinese, to hold this position after 150 years of British incumbents. Indeed, for his exceptional service to Hong Kong, he was knighted by Prince Charles just hours before the handoff of Hong Kong to China. Now, if you knew that whole thing going forward, you might not have said that the next 20 years would be the brightest years of, of now Sir Donald Chung's uh, life. But in fact, he's, his trajectory continued to go uh, and do remarkable things. Um, indeed, um, the, the opposite happened to, to uh, uh, Mr. Chung. Um, for he remained financial secretary right after the transfer. And this was incredibly important and a very good choice because during 1997 and 1998 was the Asian crisis. So here we have everybody's worried what's going to happen to Hong Kong. There were stories called the death of Hong Kong. We're in the middle of an Asian crisis, and this man is the financial secretary. And yet Hong Kong not only survived, it thrived during that very, very difficult period. He, um, he then became the sec Chief Secretary for Administration of the Hong Kong uh, Administrative Region, uh, Region Government in 2001. In 2002, Sir Donald received the Grand uh, Bahuna, Bahuina, Bahin, Bahinia. Bah Bahinia, thank you, medal from the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. This medal is the highest award uh, under the Hong Kong, uh, under Hong Kong honors, and it's a system that to recognize selected persons' lifelong and highly significant contributions to Hong Kong. So he's really come full circle, the highest awards in both settings. Um, since June of 19, 2005, uh, uh, Dr. Ch I mean, Mr. Chung has been the chief executive of the Hong Kong's special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. He was reelected re again in March 2007. Um, as the third term chief executive and uh, was formally appointed by the people's government, uh, central people's government. There are so many remarkable achievements that this man has done within Hong Kong, not the least of which is once again during a financial crisis, Hong Kong is thriving and it's prosperous and the like. He's taken on many huge challenges, not the least of which is Hong Kong will have universal suffrage for the chief executive starting in 2017. That was something he campaigned on. 
Again, something you might not have expected to necessarily happen, and it's going to happen for 2017 for chief executive, 2010 for Congress. He established a minimum wage. Again, something very uncommon in this part of the world. So um, he, of course, was a Mason fellow at this school, and that's why he's been so successful. Um, <laughs> We like to take credit, but obviously the credit is due to this man's remarkable intelligence and character. Um, I am told some Mason fellows claim that he started wearing uh, his uh, very well-known bow tie while he was here at school, but he reassures me that actually that happened two years later, so all we can do is that somehow we planted the idea um, for this bow tie. But he also remains a very strong supporter of the Mason program of the Kennedy School, we continue to have a, a terrific relationship. We do many, many executive as well as degree program engagements. And so in this 75th year, it's my very, very great pleasure and deep honor to welcome the Honorable Donald Chung. It works. Dean Elwood, students and faculty of the Kennedy School of Government. I began work in government more years ago than I care to remember. It was in an age when the word computer could still refer to people who did calculations for the observatory or the statistical department rather than to machines. As Theodore Redke, a Harvard man, once wrote, I have known inexorable sadness of pencils, neat in their boxes, or the misery of manila folders and mucilage. I know what he meant. But what great changes I have seen. The Soviet Union passing away, Hong Kong returning peacefully to China's sovereignty, and the iPad nudging out the manila folder from the corridors of government. Of great help to me in managing the many changes of my working life was the time I spent here in Kennedy School of Government in the early 1980s. Little did I know then where I might end up. Negotiations between China and Britain over Hong Kong's future were only just starting. The idea of a special administrative region with its own basic law and retaining its own legal system, financial system, government and chief executive had not yet seen the light of day. Teachers and friends from this school have stood by me through the many transitions since then. So I'm very happy to be invited back here today to join you in marking the double anniversary of 75 years of Kennedy School and 375 years of Harvard. It gives me a chance to say thank you. And I mean that most sincerely. Dean Elwood had asked me here to say more than thank you. He would like me to share my wisdom and insight, he said, with the students here, the next generation of world leaders, as he call you. Well, the best practical insight I can share is this. Study hard, think hard, and argue hard about what the teachers and case studies are saying. You never know when ideas forged in such engagement will come in handy later. Stock up on as many as you can, you won't have an opportunity like this again. Right, I've done what I wanted to do, and I have done what I've been asked to do, so we can relax now. And I tell you a few stories. The story I would like to tell you about Hong Kong and China. Some of you may know that this year is also an important anniversary for China. It is the 100th anniversary of the revolution that overthrew the Qing dynasty 
and end the millennium of dynastic rule. 100 years ago today, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the man most closely associated with that event, was making his way back home to China from the United States. He had been here in the U.S. trying to raise funds for the further attempts to revolt in southern China. He was in Denver when the news reached him that a revolution had started without him on the 10th of October in Wuhan, a city in a conservative center of China. At one level, you can read the, that as a lesson on the need for humility, that those who seek to lead events must accept that often the events leads them. And at another level, it is a reminder of the power of ideas to move men to action well beyond the reach of those who had the ideas. The idea that inspired Sun Yat-sen was a vision of good government. He has seen some sign of it during his years as a student in Hong Kong. As a mechanism to establish decent laws and administer them decently, or in John Adams' words, a government of laws, not of men, Sun Yat-sen saw good government as having fundamental social value. It creates a framework within which individuals and families can go about their lives and business with less fear, less frustration, greater possibility of mutual trust and benefit. In his days, Sun Yat-sen saw the value of good government clearly. So did many thousands of other young men and women from China who came to America, some to Harvard, in a year before 1911. So do many millions of young people across North Africa and the Middle East today. But don't think that Sun Yat-sen and his companions valued government above people. He would, I believe, have accepted the view of the early Harvard graduate Samuel Seward, who said that liberty is in real value next only to life. But he shared an understanding that had developed through human experience that in order for each citizen to enjoy liberty, not just the strong or the wealthy, it is necessary for men to become citizens by placing themselves under government. An idea of good government was not all that Sun Yat-sen took from Hong Kong. He and his contemporaries were strongly influenced by the fact that Hong Kong, like many other major ports and cities in China at the time, was under foreign control, which brings me back here to the more recent story of China and Hong Kong. This story is about how the reproach of foreign control over the part of China were resolved in a way that respected China's sovereignty, respected the unique character of Hong Kong, and respected the responsibility for Hong Kong's people to sustain their city. My life, my career in government has been part of this story. Hong Kong was a memorably, memorably described by Deng Xiaoping as a problem left over from history. What I hope long to be remembered is the manner in which that problem was resolved peaceably and transformed into benefit for the people of Hong Kong and the people of China. In his speech, great speech in favor of conciliation with the American colonies before the revolution here, Edmund Burke said that magnanimity in politics is not seldom the trust, the truest wisdom. He was not heeded at, at the time. History is full of examples of national or personal pride taking precedence over prudence. But the cases of magnanimity wins through are to be cherished. The settlement of Hong Kong is one such a case. It allowed the city to return to China while retaining its own distinct way of life and systems. National pride and unity demanded a resumption of sovereignty. Magnanimity allowed the different way of life in Hong Kong to be taken as something of value to be preserved and allowed to flourish. The foundations of, this, of that different way of life 
were underwritten by the basic law of Hong Kong. Having assurance of these foundations, on 1st July 1997, 7 million people, that's more than the recorded population of the United States in 1776, could face the future with confidence and hope. Hope has taken a hammering so far in this new millennium, not just in Hong Kong, but all around the world. The relentless waves of financial turmoil, the dissolution of old patterns of employment and social relations under the influence of technology and globalization, the evidence of man's mounting impact on the functioning of the planet that sustains us, the spread of terrorism and hatred, all these feed an atmosphere of uncertainty and insecurity. Men and women who thought of themselves as middle class are joining the poor, not just in a developing world, but in the heart of developed cities. In the words of protest in Tel Aviv, they're having to fight for an accessible future. Once more, we hear the echoes of Emerson, the things are in a saddle and ride mankind, rather than we feeling that we are the masters of our life. Uncertainty, insecurity, loss of economic hope, widening inequality, these breed loss of trust in the institution of government. The loss of trust gives ground for the grammar of discord to displace the grammar of discourse. These changes in the environment within which government must be exercised affect us all. In some ways, Hong Kong has had an easier time over the past decade than many other economies. Our freedom from public debt, our position besides China's growing economy, our prudent banking supervision, these have all helped to cushion us from, one, from some, some of the shocks that have come our way. But as a small open economy, our city is open to the rise and fall of financial markets and the swirling changes of the global economy. Patterns of employment and of income distribution have been changing fast. Experiments have become urgent to find new ways of making our living in the world. As cities dwellers, we too are having to relearn how to live together successfully amid all the contending rhythm of this strange new world of ours. Much has been made of the billions that Hong Kong is pouring into the infrastructure railway and road uh, to the mainland, the facilities for new industries and the foundations for a new cultural district. I don't want to downplay the importance of these physical developments for present, for present employment and for future prospects. However, I'd like to stress some of the other endeavors, ones less invisible to the eyes, but no less fundamental. Amid the economic gyration of the past decade, we have been trying to see through reforms in education. The aim of these reforms is to endow citizens, not simply train factors of production. The president of this university, um, in her inaugural address in 2007, Drew put the point very well. She spoke of learning that molds of a lifetime, learning that shapes the future. I share her conviction absolutely. We are not just preparing to build new museums and cultural venues. We are trying to encourage the human capacity that allows every citizen to be touched and inspired by art, to reach out in the minds of, to the world, to ensure that heritage of our city, seen and unseen, is held in remembrance. These things matter to the life of any society. They provide a common point of reference to help us talk, to learn, to live together amicably. We are trying to ensure that our banks and financial markets remain healthy and open, these institutions have value. But that value emerges where they are governed to serve society, not where they take license to subvert it. Now, pause for a moment and think about the kind of issues we are having to tackle and the actions we are taking. Are they problems in relations with the mainland of China? No. Are we constrained in how we act by mainland officials? No. 
Standing in counterpoint to the story of economic uncertainty over the past 14 years, in the story of the continued growth of Hong Kong as a unique, remarkable society, is a story of one country, two systems, at work and working well. Looked at it from the perspective of a little region of Hong Kong, with its 7 million people, what is happening in the mainland with its 1.3 billion people seems a bit daunting. Ask Hong Kong students what they think about mainland students in our universities, and they worry about them working harder and having a more international outlook. But then turn things around. Ask the mainland students what they think. They say that Hong Kong students have broader horizons and high aspirations. Look at Hong Kong's financial regulations. Maintaining global access to and trust in Hong Kong's financial investment and insurance markets matters greatly to us. It also matters deeply to the mainland as it continues to reform and liberalize its own financial systems. Look at our own legal system. Sustaining and developing the common law tradition in our courts matters to each resident of Hong Kong. Particularly, it matters for Hong Kong's participation in the international economy. It does more. It sustains Hong Kong's ability to help serve the mainland's integration into the world economy. Visiting our cities earlier this year, Vice Premier Li Keqiang reflected on the significance of Hong Kong's maintaining a separate system. He spoke of Hong Kong's irreplaceable role in China's reform, opening up a modernization drive. Maintaining the distinctiveness of Hong Kong's system is a key emphasis of the basic law. That law is not just Hong Kong's constitutional document. It stands as a statement of China's national policy. By establishing clearly Hong Kong's position as part of one country, while retaining a separate system, the basic law renewed Hong Kong's role in the history of China's transformation. Today, Hong Kong and China have a combined investment of over 800 billion US dollars in each other's economies. That is a huge investment in each other's future. And almost any street in Hong Kong today, you will find visitors from the mainland. Some have come for business, others to shop, others to enjoy the city, or take back home with them some ideas of how Hong Kong works. Moving the other way, Hong Kong people are visiting and working in China in ever larger numbers each year. We are also working closely with the adjoining Guangdong province to pilot reforms measures that the central government can then consider for wider adoption across the country. Put all this together and you see a huge investment of people, of money and of ideas to help shape a decent future for the citizens of Hong Kong and of China. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no crystal ball in which to see how exactly Hong Kong's future's history will be written. But I have trust in the capacity of the citizens of Hong Kong to keep writing a good history. I have also conviction in the responsibility of every man and woman in whatever circumstances, whether called to work on a public stage or just to act among family and friends, to try the best to do justice and live peaceably with our neighbors. That is the backbone on which our societies and our prospects as communities depend. For all of you here called to public service, I can think of no better place to hone your skills and refine your purpose than here at the Kennedy School. The world will definitely change around you, yet the lessons you learn here will endure indefinitely. Each of you has had experiences in your own hometowns that have inspired you to service. I hope that some of you may find inspiration in the story of my hometown. I trust that each of you will cause stories to be written and will inspire generations to come. Perhaps some of you may even venture to Hong Kong to become part of our narrative. History has not ended. 
Each generation has an opportunity to write new chapters. Get writing. Thank you very much. In just a moment, we're going to turn to questions. There are four microphones in the audience, one right here, another up there, third one there, a third there. I recommend you go to the place that has the shortest line. Um, and a good question has three elements. The first is you identify yourself. Uh, the second is it is short and contains just one thought. And the third is that it ends with a question mark. And <laughs> To just demonstrate, uh, let me ask the first question. My name is David Elwood. Um, I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and my question is this. Um, you are about to finish up your term coming up in, in, uh, at the end of June. And the, uh, you've presided over a period where, both of prosperity, but where, in general, most people in the world would say uh, Hong Kong has been well governed. This is a time when much of the world feels great frustrations with their own governments, their own capacities, and so forth. Do you have an insight or two that you might be willing to share with the rest of us, not just in China, but the rest of the world, about one or two things that one really has to focus on to have a well-functioning government that's competitive, with little, limited corruption, human development, and so forth? Well, that's a very serious question. <laughs> uh, I, I must say that I, I, I'm very really overwhelmed by, 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 by charity of yourself that, 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 that says that I, I, I govern well. I hope my, my people of whom I serve agree with you. Uh, I also have a little crowd out in Hong Kong there. Uh, you, have, um, you have Occupy Wall Street. I have some people say Occupy HSBC. Um, <laughs> There are also very a lot of young, angry young men asking for, for their own apartment, which they said they can't afford in Hong Kong. But it's quite rightly, Dean, we, 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 we have done, uh, the, economy, the economy is doing quite well, and uh, we have survived you know, several crises reasonably well. Uh, it is very difficult to generalize it. As far as I'm concerned, in governing, the most important thing that people have to learn, and most leaders find it very difficult to learn, and it took me some time to learn, the first thing is humility. Humility to understand that uh, the people you serve give you great honor, but at the same time expect you to be wholly accountable what you do and what you don't do. And it requires a lot of courage to accept that. And the second thing is, is very important, is very, very much so, is hard work. You have to prioritize your work well, but at the same time, once you have done your priority, one, the most important, the, 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 say the first, first three most important issues that as a chief executive or as a president of a country of any, or of a prime minister of, of another nation, we have to decide. You just cannot just skim over things. You have to go deep into the issue. You have, first of all, you understand the priority. For the chosen priorities, you have to work very hard to make sure you understand the issues, the substantive issues, then work out the ramifications and I'll try to find the solutions. And um, it means um, in modern government, you have to brave all the criticism that was thrown at you during the time, but at the same time expect you to work as hard as academics here in Harvard. Um, Perhaps harder, yes. Um, thank you very much. Right, well, I'll start right here. Hello, um, my name is Sarah Jane Ho. I'm a student at the business school and I'm a native of Hong Kong. Um, so, in Hong Kong, I feel that local discontent is actually at its highest today. Uh, we, re we placed, I see people nodding, we placed first in the world for the widest rich-poor income gap based on the Gini coefficient. Property prices have spiked over 50% in the last two years due to the influx of mainland Chinese who are spending on money, um, spending on property. And in fact, uh, also this summer, the second biggest issue is that Hong Kong, local Hong Kong women didn't have enough hospital beds to give birth, again, because of the influx of mainland women wishing to give birth in Hong Kong. So my question is, today you've spoken of the successes of the Hong Kong-China integration. What about, what about the failures? 
Well, you see, it, you, people have always found things that goes wrong, which is true. Uh, let me just put it this way. You have, in governing, you have taken in a broad canvas and what is people's livelihood. Look at it socially, politically, economically. Over the last 14 years, Hong Kong has made huge advancement on each and every front, whether it is in the case of democracy advancement, whether it is in, in terms of GDP growth, and whether it is per capita income, or whether it is in the case of um, the people at the grassroots. But we do have problems, like housing, like health, well care, health care, and so on, the things we have mentioned. And um, then particularly when you have um, more people going into universities, and uh, they come out and they want to see the future. And many of them cannot see through the future. Um, but they don't realize that most, other, most graduates come out, come through universities where they work hard, and before they, they, they never know where they end up with. In my case, at least, uh, I, I, 10 years ago, I have not realized I have to do this job of mine. 20 years ago, I had not realized I could be, I, I, I could be in a position of, of, of influence that I have, that I have been, I've been able to serve Hong Kong. So I would say that um, these things is natural. The people today, you have, you have more seasoned young people asking uh, for uh, not the, uh, the, the, what they believe is essential things of life, like uh, carbon emissions, like, for instance, ownership of homes. In my age, for instance, we usually try to own, a, own an apartment or a flat when we reach the age of 40-something, when we have a second child. But nowadays, our graduates want to own their own homes once on graduation. So aspirations are quite different. Um, but as far as you say, the failures of Hong Kong, but it is difficult, uh, I think, to, to say that the shortage of housing for young people is considered to be a failure of government as such. But if you use that, then none of the governments in the world would work. Um, so we have put it in a good, better perspective. As far as um, providing maternity uh, beds for our own people, that's a priority. Of course, Hong Kong is an open place. We allow people to come in, and there have been uh, some stress in our hospital system. But none of our pregnant ladies would have found it difficult to find a hospital bed. Um, we, in fact, treasure and have been encouraging pregnancy in our uh, young people and have not been very successful. <laughs> uh, if you say there's a failure, there's a failure on our part, but don't blame China for it. But if you look at Hong Kong from the sort of fear people have, the collapse of legal system, the dysfunction of government, and the collapse of economy. None of these things happen. In fact, the other way around. And we have come up better than many other economies in surviving the crisis we have one after, one after another. Well, I agree with you. There are lots of things that we have to deal with. You mentioned Gini coefficient. You know, you know as I know, you just don't measure. Dean I will tell you, you just don't measure um, uh, people's, people's, uh, um, people's livelihood simply by measuring their, their salaries and the income. If you put in a social wage that we have in terms of housing, in terms of all the other services we provided in, it's not too bad at all. It compared quite favorably with any, any financial center. It's about 0 .0 0 0.42 or something, which is not 0 0.5 that people measure about. So, I agree with you, there's a lot of things we have to work up with. There's a lot of things we should improve in Hong Kong. And there are still many young, angry young people in Hong Kong too, as in any other cities. But please put it in perspective. This is a vibrant economy. If you looked at it, measure it, and from any, from, from, from any angle, um, we are not doing too badly. But I agree with you, there are a lot of things we need to improve upon, including things like healthcare services, and the property prices, as far as property prices is concerned, the measures we have taken has now seen some good results. Prices are moderating down, and we are now launching a major program of construction by the government for people at the grassroots. So I hope we welcome you to a um, happier Hong Kong when you return to Hong Kong. Right up here. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Ian Chang. I'm a sophomore at the college from Taipei. Um, and you've been talking about the successes of integration, and to a certain extent that's very true, but when I visit you know, Hong Kong uh, and the mainland, the differences are still very stark in terms of political freedoms, economic livelihood, and so on and so forth. Does, does this divide between what the people in Hong Kong enjoy versus the people in the mainland, doesn't that separate 
uh, that separateness uh, conflict with the very principle of restitution? Doesn't this separateness continue to divide people of Hong Kong from uh, their, um, you know, their, their, their brethren back at the mainland? Well, you can compare any other places from Hong Kong, compare it with Macau, compare us with Taiwan, compare it with the mainland. There's, they, there's bound to be some gap and difference. Um, in fact, if we look at China as a nation, there's a major diversity in, 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 in natural endowment and also in terms of economic performance in, from a coastal region in the east from, as you compare that with, with the west or in the main, in, into the inland. So in case of Hong Kong, when I say it works, in a sense that Deng Xiaoping created the concept one country, two systems. And we are able to sustain our way of life, our own systems, and provide a better living for all people in Hong Kong. And in the process, we are able to help China to reach out to the rest of the world, and we'll help China at the same time uh, uh, to, to provide a, 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 a lot more funding through our securities market, through the investment from Hong Kong. So I think the, the enterprise has been mutually beneficial, but there will be a difference. There will be a difference. In any case, we have a different legal system. In Hong Kong, we practice common law. In the mainland, we practice continental law legal system. So it will be a, a, but the difference, it, it, if it, that encourages you to do even better and challenge each other, I think it will be a mutually beneficial thing in the long run. You do not look at differences as things of contention, but rather as a way in which that we have to coexist in any community peacefully, finding common grounds, but not necessarily concentrating on the points of differences as point of contention. Uh, I do not see the difference of Hong Kong from China, mainland of China has been a great impediment of integration. Um, and I do not see Hong Kong changing as a result of this integration, impacting negatively on our legal system, on our social system, or economic system. Nor do I see that the amalgamation of law, the return of sovereignty of Hong Kong, has impacted negatively in the growth of China over years. So if you look at it in summation, we are doing better, mainland is doing better. The difference remains. Right up here. Dr. Sao Neho. My name is Elsa. I'm a student at the Kennedy School and a business school. I spent most Those of my schools. life <laughs> yes. I spent most of my life living in Hong Kong, seeing the torch being t passed from Governor Wilson to Patton to Mr. Dong and now on to you. So reflecting upon the legacy that you're leaving to Hong Kong, can you share with us the wisest decision and the most foolish decision you've made? <laughs> Um, well, it's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult for us to talk with his own wisdom and, and stupidity. Um, but all I can, perhaps, perhaps, I think those remarks should be, should be made by others looking at my record of service. Um, all I can say is if I want to do it again, it might happen differently. But um, I have few regrets. Um, and sometimes the decision is not entirely for your own making anyway. Um, events, as I mentioned there in my speech, um, force you to a certain way of, of mind and, and, and you take you to certain decisions um, that ends up to something which is unpredictable as well. But if I, as I said, if I look at it in the round, look at, Hong, or look at Hong Kong, not only in my term, but since the reversion of administration in 1997 to China, Hong Kong has been able to advance politically, socially, and economically. Our people live better, live longer, and I hope it's generally happier. Um, as, far my, far, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a servant of the people and I hope I've done something to contribute that little bit. Um, but, uh, but it must continue on. I have lots of faith in Hong Kong people. It's quite a unique breed of people. And if I may say so, I venture to say perhaps the most creative and most innovative. Um, 
society, communities of ethnic Chinese in around the world. And I think my success or my stupidity cannot be measured in terms of single person. It must be measured in terms of how the community as a whole has fared during this period. I think we have done not too badly. And personally, as I said, I have no regrets. And I am certainly retiring a very happy man. <laughs> right here. Hi, uh, my name is Sion Jie from uh, Harvard Medical School. I was born in Hong Kong and I witnessed the uh, handover of Hong Kong in 1997. Okay, and obviously I'm a Hong Kong citizen and I will move back to Hong Kong one day. I, I care about Hong Kong and I know that right now there are problems internally about the housing market in Hong Kong and externally there's problem about how to compete or assimilate with the mainland China. So my question is that uh, for the next term government, what will you suggest them to do to ask from the Chinese government which resources in terms of support that you want to get from the Chinese government which you didn't get in your term? I don't, I don't get a feeling that our, our government is in Hong Kong as a special administrative region always asking the things from mainland China. That's not the way it works. Um, everything we have asked for, every joint policy that we produce, for, whether it is uh, in relation to a free trade agreement between ourselves and the mainland, or uh, for instance, the creation of international financial center in Hong Kong to service um, the trade in renminbi. These are all proposals good for the nation as a whole. They're good for Hong Kong, but it must be mutually beneficial. So I never feel that I'm in cap in hand to Beijing, please give me this and give me that. It's not the case. I demonstrate how we can both do better under slightly different arrangements with a new creation of things, whether it's renminbi, as I said, or whether it's a SIPA with a free trade agreement, or with or any collaboration we have on the medical, on the public health side, or whether it's an education. I feel it's a, it's, it's a joint effort after all. Um, I'm sure my successor will find interesting, to do, it's interesting things to do. As the lady has mentioned to you, we haven't resolved the housing problem because not every air graduates have an apartment to go to and they can afford. So we have to find a solution there. And, um, but I believe that the arrangement of one country, two systems, what we have done for the nation and what the nation has done for Hong Kong and the, the, amount of, the, the amount of investment we have put in each other in terms of people, talent, skill, and even dollars has shown that the partnership is working well. And I'm sure there are all things that we have to continue doing. For instance, in the next government, we have to design the way in which universal suffrage uh, is going to take, take place in 2017. Uh, we have got a timetable but we haven't got a design yet. And this is something we have to work out with the, gov with the, main and with, 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 with the central government. This is under the basic law, it's not something we can wholly control. So I think the first thing we have to do is work, work that out. And it would be with the help of the central government as well. But it's not on things that we have to beg and ask, because I'm sure the, such a design will be good for Hong Kong and also good for the nation as well. Right over here. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, I will try to stick to your three points. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Rajesh. Uh, uh, my relationship to Harvard is I co-founded a cancer um, biotech startup with uh, a professor from uh, Harvard Medical School and the BIDMC. Uh, we hope to treat cancer uh, by means of uh, a broad spectrum, tough cancer, uh, less toxic, and also affordable to every patient, even without the uh, insurance company being paying it. Uh, so this is the idea. Besides what uh, I do with uh, this company named by Conform, I also advise uh, um, healthcare delivery company in terms of uh, how to deliver a quality healthcare um, to everyone, not only uh, in U.S. but also to 80% of a majority of a human race currently don't have access to hospital and doctor office. Is there a office. question buried somewhere there? There's a question buried behind it. I happen to be in um, Hong Kong twice, and uh, my philosophy being Hong Kong is uh, to appreciate and understand the localization of Hong Kong, for instance, its health care systems. On one of my slides, which I show at the Sloan question School, mark. Uh, coming mark. up. Uh, Real uh, quick. 
other people would like to ask. Apologize. Questions. So the key, uh, from my uh, perspective, uh, looking at Hong Kong, is uh, it's a, a great uh, territory. But uh, compared to a place like uh, um, Singapore, uh, South Korea, and uh, Japan, in terms of healthcare research, science development, I had an uh, opportunity to visit your new, uh, brand new science park. In terms of next administration, besides uh, the hardware we are building in Hong Kong, how to emphasize bring the uh, technology research and the particular development, bring things to the market, commercialization, uh, to help not only treating, um, taking care of uh, citizens of Hong Kong, but promoting science and uh, medicine to treating human race. Thank you. Well, uh, the little Hong Kong cannot just try to help and introduce healthcare system for the whole human race. But, I, but we, 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 sp we spend quite a lot of energies in looking at our healthcare system in Hong Kong. And we're learning from what the United States have done, what, what President Obama has done here in this country too. It is um, an exceedingly complex question. It is also very resource intensive. Um, at the moment, we, we spend about 17% of our whole total government spending program on health care. And, and we are producing pretty good results. Um, but bringing it forward requires not only uh, training our new doctors, nurses, and all the paramedics that we need, but also new technologies, as you say so. Um, but we, have, we rely most of these on to our medical schools in Hong Kong. We have two fine medical schools, one in Hong Kong University, one in Chinese universities. And um, they, we are also encouraging um, establishment of, of private hospitals in Hong Kong uh, to introduce what we call a new uh, a, a, a healthcare. A, 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 a. For us, the healthcare is, is an industry which Hong Kong will be able to, to encourage. Uh, we may bring in economic advantages for Hong Kong as well. But, all, but you mentioned about the amount of research we do. It is done through our university mainly, but I'm happy for, for suggestion how we can make it better and make it uh, more meaningful and make, and make our dollar travel a bit longer. Um, but we have no shame in saying that uh, we are doing quite well in this regard. Life expectancy in Hong Kong is longer than that in Singapore, longer than Korea that you mentioned. In fact, it's the longest in the world. We have surpassed the Japanese somewhat in terms of men. I don't know why a men didn't, didn't live longer in Hong Kong. And the women also manage 60, 86, and men up to 80 years of age. Um, but in terms of research and technology, um, we have a fine um, medical team there doing this. But of, as, as you know, nothing will be enough. Uh, we want to do more as well. But if you have, you have ideas how it could be improve our system, we are all ears. Right up here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Frankie Wong. I'm a junior at the college. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, but moved to the United States when I was eight. So my question to you is actually something that uh, I, I lead the Harvard Model UN team here. And one thing that we did last year is that we had a simulation of Hong Kong in 2047. So, um, I mean, we are only 36 years away from this point of, um, you know, separating, uh, right now we are, of course, as you mentioned during your talk, a tale of two systems. But in 2047, as many, many of us know, it, there's a possibility for us you know, merging back into one. I wonder what's your thought on this, and your view, if there's one thing that you want to implement in China, I mean in Hong Kong in 2047, what would it be? Well, The 50 years regime was devised by Deng Xiaoping to give, to inspire confidence in people that things are not going to change for a long while. If the two systems are working well for the nation as a whole, including people in Hong Kong, if we have a better life and our own way of life, enjoying a whole full range of freedoms, and the mainland of China is also deriving benefits from the operation of Hong Kong's markets, in Hong Kong systems, and I'm sure it's going to survive 50 years and go beyond 50 years. There's no reason to change just for the change's sake if it's good for the nation as a whole. And from the experience of our last, seven, last 14 years, it is quite clearly it's working well for Hong Kong and working well for the nation. So I'm pretty confident if the present pattern continues, the one country, two systems is going to continue beyond 2047, 27. 2047, the legal system will be different, 
social system was somewhat different. Economic system would be more integrated, but I'm sure the distinctiveness of Hong Kong should endure. We have time for just two more questions. Um, the, uh, the chief executive has got, to, has got a very tight schedule and was very kind to join us here. Right here. Hello, Ms. Sun. My name is Xu Yang Yang from mainland China, and I'm a current undergrad student in the University of Hong Kong. As you mentioned in your speech that Hong Kong witnessed the increasing connectedness with mainland China and uh, mainland Chinese, including myself, come to Hong Kong for different purposes. Um, but meanwhile, we see that since the reunification of cross-border families and the n n number of uh, new immigrants to Hong Kong increase, we see that Hong Kong's medical care and educational systems are heating their capacities. Can you give us some light on what specific steps the government is going to take or uh, are taking uh, to ease these problems. Thank you. As far as the medical services is concerned, our priority is always given to the indigenous Hong Kong people. But we still have capacity through the creation of private hospitals to deal with uh, people from, from overseas and from the mainland. And I believe this is a strength of Hong Kong we should develop into a medical hub which serve not only Hong Kong people, but perhaps for the whole region as well, including the mainland of China. Um, I don't see anything wrong, any threat in that. The fact of the matter is we should do more and do more quickly uh, in Hong Kong's case. Educational system, I'm worried about the other thing. Because, you know, our, as I mentioned, the fertility rate in Hong Kong is exceedingly low. Our schools are empty. We are closing down primary schools. We are closing down secondary schools. So I'm quite happy that, that we plan now for uh, re the, the return of the kids who have been born in Hong Kong and have been going back to the mainland, uh, studying primary school and coming back to Hong Kong for secondary education and going to, through our universities. I welcome them to come back. And I'm sure that we have to make preparation for them. At the moment, we do not know exactly the pattern of return. Uh, whether they return at the age of 14 or whether they return later on at the age of 18 or whether a bit earlier, but something I'm sure that we will happily devise. What Hong Kong needs is human capital. The more we have, the better. At the moment, the, the fertility rate is such that we have um, not too many years, so three years ago, our, our, our each, each of our women, each of our women just bear only 0 point, 0, uh, 0 0.95 uh, in whole fertile life. And we need 2.1 for replacement level. At the moment, we just man manage one. So the more merrier, please come back to Hong Kong. More of you is coming back to Hong Kong. <laughs> and bear children. <laughs> this is our last question right here. Yeah, it's my honor to ask you the last question, um, Chief Executive uh, Chang. My name is Teresa Chang. I'm from the reporter from the Sampan newspapers, a community new paper, newspapers in Boston. My question to you is uh, approaching the end of your term. So what do you want the people, especially in Hong Kong, to remember you by? And what legacy do you want the people to write in history or probably remember at the end? However, and also actually, do you have any advice for the next chief executive? No, I think uh, this is, as far as the next chief executive is concerned, I'm sure he's a bright and able person. He doesn't need any teaching from me. But we learn from, we should learn from in a job, and particularly what has happened. Events will guide him. Um, but I, I really want uh, to be remem remember no more than I am a loyal servant of Hong Kong people and no more. Well, thank you very much, Dean Elwood. Thank you. It's, it's been a been pleasure a to return. Great honor having you here. Thank you. Let me a words here. Hang on one second. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask that people remaining in their chairs, please, uh, so that uh, the chief executive can get on to his uh, very, very busy schedule. Just a couple of reminders. Tomorrow we have uh, Barney Frank coming to talk about the emperor has too many clothes, uh, the deficit, the Pentagon, and the quality of life in America. And on Monday, November 14th, we have the Glauber Lecture delivered by Doug Schulman, uh, head of the Internal Revenue Service. Thanks again. Please remain seated. Uh, thanks again to Donald Chung for your terrific talk. Thanks so much.